Volume 2 of Classic Farm Machinery begins at the final plough-off of the 1972 British National Ploughing Championships. Although right-handed ploughs were, and still are, used at ploughing matches, most farmers have changed to reversible ploughing by the late 1960s. Some reckon they were one-way ploughs, others described them as two-way ploughs, but no matter what they were called, ploughing started at one side of the field and finished at the opposite hedge. Tractors were mainly two-wheel drive until the end of the 1960s, but change was in the air. Four-wheel drive conversions, mainly by county and roadless, were already popular on large arable farms. The Doe 130, which replaced the Triple D, was one way of providing four-wheel drive during the 1960s and early 1970s. The Paramount conversion kit, which linked two tractors, retained the front wheels and the leading tractor. It was described by some as a four-man's Triple D, and it wasn't difficult to separate the tractors when the heavy work was done. Four-wheel drive options in 1970 included the 115 horsepower roadless 115 with its equal sized wheels and the 67 horsepower four-wheel drive Sammy Leone with small front wheels. It had an air-cooled diesel engine and cost £1,995 X-Works. The articulated four-wheel drive 105 horsepower Massey Ferguson 1200 was launched in 1972. It was replaced by the 112 horsepower MF 1250 before production ceased in 1980. There were, and still are, some farmers who prefer crawler tractors. The main contenders in the early 1970s included the Fiat 70 with a trailed Ransom's plough. And the Marshall 70C. This model with a Ransom's mounted plough was one of the first crawler tractors to have three-point linkage. David Brown were one of the first manufacturers to comply with the new 1970 safety cab and frame regulations. All prototype cabs were given a severe test to make sure they were strong enough to meet the standards set by these regulations. During the early 1960s, some agricultural engineers came up with the idea of a driverless tractor. This design used a system of cables which could be buried in the soil and the tractor steered itself with sensor heads attached to the bonnet. There were some obvious problems here. So, was remote control with radio signals the answer? A transmitter was used to steer the tractor, change gear, operate the hydraulic lift, even open the bonnet. But it couldn't top up the battery and the tractor driver kept his job. Tractors with engines of 250 horsepower or more were made by several companies during the mid and late 70s. This American-built 335 horsepower Ford FW60 has a 225 gallon fuel tank. Caterpillar introduced the rubber tracked 280 horsepower Challenger 65 to British farmers in 1989. More recent models include the 325 horsepower Challenger 75C and the 210 horsepower Challenger 35. Back in the late 1960s, tractor power had overtaken plough design. Reversible ploughs weren't always big enough to make full use of this newfound power, and some farmers went back to right-handed ploughs, like this six-furrow Bamford plough on a BM Volvo tractor. Plough designers soon caught up, however, and this five-furrow semi-mounted Lemkin was a good load for the County 1124.
With hydraulic linkages available for most crawlers by the early 1970s, they could be used with reversible ploughs, including this four-furrow Ransoms and this four-furrow Bonnell reversible with hydraulic turnover. An earlier model had a system of pulleys and wire ropes linked to the crawler drawbar, which reversed the plough when turning on the headland. A new name in plough manufacture had appeared in the late 60s. Warwickshire farmer Roger Dowdswell couldn't find a suitable plough for his crawler, so he made one using Ransom's bodies. The mounted DP1, Dowdswell Plough 1, soon had a stable mate in the shape of the semi-mounted DP2. The 215 horsepower John Deere 8430 seemed to have few problems with this seven-furrow Dowdswell plough. Lemkin and Ransom's reversible ploughs, including the TS84 on the John Deere 2120 and the two-furrow Lemkin on the Leyland 262 were popular ploughs for 60 to 80 horsepower tractors during the early and mid 1970s when the 62 horsepower Leyland 262 cost £5,122. Dowdswell ploughs were well established by the late 1970s. This Fiat 120 crawler is pulling a five-furrow Dowdswell DP2. Prices were on an upward spiral by 1977. The Fiat 120 crawler was close to £18,000. Like the county and roadless four-wheel drive tractors, the Muir Hill 101 was based on a Ford skid unit. The plough was a Ransom's TSR 106 reversible. By the late 1970s, right-handed ploughs were still used in some areas, but most farmers were finally converted to reversible ploughing. Furrow presses were used in the early days of tractor ploughing and didn't really disappear. By the early 1980s, it was becoming a common practice to hitch a furrow press to a reversible plough. In 1982, a front-mounted plough was considered a good way to counterbalance heavy rear-mounted ploughs. However, push-pull ploughs soon fell from favour. Matching the work of front and rear bodies wasn't easy and there were a problem on narrow roads. Most tractors over 70 horsepower had four-wheel drive by the late 80s, and by this time, reversible ploughs had disc coulters only on the rear bodies. Some had none at all. Slatted mould boards, which improve soil movement on sticky soils, appeared in the early 90s. Slatted mould boards are also fitted to the Rabi plough on this Mercedes-Benz Unimog with electronic draft control and a fast tractor suspension system. The 280 horsepower Caterpillar Challenger, with a touch under £120,000, was well able to handle the 12 furrow Dowdswell plough at this 1991 demonstration. And the 210 horsepower Marshall TM200, also with rubber tracks, had no problem pulling this 7 furrow Dowdswell DP2. Originating from America, the Square plough took the country by storm in 1990. They were simple to use had few wearing parts and worked well on hard, dry land. But by 1993, after wet autumn, most of them were left in the barn. This Rabi plough with slatted mould boards is equipped with a furrow cracker. Introduced in 1995, it's more effective in normal ploughing conditions. Multi-furrow reversible ploughs, some with variable furrow width adjustment, at a 1995 demonstration include this seven furrow Cavernland on a Massey Ferguson 6150. A new Holland Ford 8430 with a semi-mounted eight furrow Lemkin plough. 
and the JCB Fast Track 85 makes light work of pulling a six furrow plough. In another field, a 260 horsepower John Deere 8400 made rapid progress with its 10 furrow Gregoire Besson articulated plough. And an 11 furrow Dowdswell reversible causes no problems for the 325 horsepower Caterpillar Challenger 75C. Why plough? The question on many lips in the 1970s. Minimal cultivation methods were possible with chisel ploughs, like the Bomford Superflow, and many farmers thought that perhaps the mouldboard plough had had its day. Many companies made chisel ploughs to cater for this new technique, including this Palmiter, pulled by a Belarus tractor, and Alpha Accord. Ransoms also joined the minimal cultivation scene with this heavy cultivator, which, in spite of its looks, the company insisted was not a chisel plough. Vicon introduced the rotor spar to British farmers in the late 70s as yet another alternative to the plough. This power-driven spading machine didn't attract much interest from farmers, but it was used by some market gardeners. Soil compaction and drainage problems caused by heavy tractors also brought subsoilers into fashion during the 1970s. Subsoilers had been used occasionally for many years. This heavy-duty twin-leg model on a dough tool carrier was used before crawlers were equipped with a three-point linkage. The new breed of subsoilers included the Lely Brennig, with an oscillating blade in front of the leg. A simple single leg model made by Bomford and Evershed, seen on a Deutz 7206A tractor, and the Howard Paratine with angled legs. Although used less often, subsoilers can usually be seen after a hot, dry summer, and the latest models have wings to increase their effect. Hedges still needed to be trimmed, sometimes by hand, and this was an easier task if the hook was sharp. Although less popular than in earlier years, it was still possible to buy a new circular saw hedge cutter in the early 1970s. This Fisher Humphreys machine could be used with a saw blade or a flail head. Most hedge cutters sold after the mid-1970s were flail machines. They became more versatile as time passed with increased reach and hydraulic motor drive. This McConnell hedger has its own oil tank and power takeoff driven pump. Cutter bar models, reminiscent of the earlier McConnell power arm, are still being made for compact and other small tractors. But in spite of some public outcry, the flail hedger was here to stay.
Bomford and Evershed have made hedge cutters for many years. The first was attached to a Fordson standard. The farm trim flail hedger was in Bomford's mid-1980s range. Also, the super trim, used mainly by agricultural contractors, seen here on a Leyland 702. By the mid-1970s, many farmers were drilling most of their cereal crops in the autumn. And this work, together with the root harvest, changed the pattern of farming. Stubble cultivating usually preceded ploughing, often with one of the many models of springtime cultivator available at the time. A new design of subsoiler appeared in the early 1970s. The McConnell Shakerator was different because it had vibrating tines operated by an eccentric flywheel arrangement driven by the power takeoff. The shakerator could be used on its own or with a power-driven cultivator. Linked to the McConnell tillerator, this combination converted stubble fields to autumn seed beds at a rapid pace. New cultivation machinery was gradually replacing the more traditional tined implements by 1970. The Bomford turbo tiller with ground-driven rotary blades at a working depth of five inches. And according to the makers of the CB rotary harrow, the best results were obtained by driving the tractor at high speed. Power takeoff driven power harrows in use at the time included the Vicon with four reciprocating time bars. And the Benedict power harrow with two time bars, which certainly gave the tractor driver a more comfortable ride. Meanwhile, in Holland, Lely designers had already made and tested the Rotera. This model, with its rotary tines, was shown to British farmers in 1968. And within a few years, it brought about a new era in cultivation machinery. Disc harrows still had their place. Some of them were quite wide. Others, very wide indeed. Springtime cultivators, narrow and wide versions, also survived the test of time. Rolls have changed little over the years, but they are much wider. Some are folded with hydraulic rams for transport purposes. Others have an end toe arrangement. By the mid-1980s, power harrows were in widespread use. The Lely Rotera had sprouted either a packer roll or a crumbler roll at the rear. And some were so wide that it became necessary to fold them for transport. Power harrows remain dominant in the arable farming scene. This 1995 Lely Rotera is working in combination with a front press on a Lamborghini. The latest Unimog makes light work of pulling a Dowdswell power harrow. This Cavernland harrow is well within the capability of the Massey Ferguson 6150. But here's a surprise. This 1995 Falk rotary harrow on a Zetor tractor has a close resemblance to the Bomford turbo tiller and similar machines of the late 1960s. Perhaps change is in the air. The Howard rotor drill, attached to a Howard rotivator, was an early example of the modern combination drilling technique. The rotor drill was used in the early 70s, mainly on unbroken stubble. The early days of the don't plough unless you have to era saw the rise and fall of direct drills. Taskers and Bettinson, among others, made direct drills with heavy-duty disc coulters. An international harvester produced a direct drill with the seed tubes attached to heavy spring tines. Drilling cereals in narrower rows became popular in the 1970s. The Ransom's Nordstrom drill had close-space coulters for this type of work. 
Combine drills like this International Harvester outfit were still much in fashion and air drills were beginning to catch on. The Tive Combine drill has a power takeoff driven fan unit. Air drills with a single metering unit and distribution manifold for the seed tubes were in use by the early 1980s. Oh dear, let's hope that pin doesn't fall out. This tune combine drill could be supplied with disc or soffit filters. Also from the mid-1980s, the Vicon Super Seeder has close spaced rows and air feed to the soffit filters. The drill story comes up to date with the Lely Rotera and Combi drill outfit with a land wheel metering unit supplying seed to the air feed system. And for the really high outputs, the front hopper carries additional seed, which is transferred to the rear hopper, giving long periods of non-stop drilling. And the Amazon Power Harrow and Drill is another example of the wide variety of cultivated drill combinations in current use. Some of the latest cultivator drill combinations don't include a power harrow. Cultivator tines prepare the seedbed on the Vedastat drill. Air from a power-driven fan carries the seed to the coulters and zero-pressure tyres consolidate the soil. And this flexi-coil cultivator combination with a following drill is another way to cover a lot of ground in no time at all. And in case you've forgotten, this was one of the more popular drills in the 1950s. Spinning disc and oscillating spout fertiliser spreaders were used on most farms, but full width machines like the Accord air spreader were becoming popular by the early 1970s. Ten years later, full-width spreaders gave a more accurate spreading pattern than many spinning disc broadcasters. This Amazon spreader is typical of several makes in use by the late 70s. Trailed models with large capacity hoppers were added to the range of mounted bike on vary spreaders, and these machines remained in production throughout the 1980s. Spinner broadcaster design had been improved by the mid-80s. Some broadcasters had a single disc, Others, like the Lely Centerliner, with twin discs, which offer improved accuracy and wider spread pattern, has brought spinner broadcasters back into fashion. Recent improvements include hopper tilting mechanisms to keep fertilizer away from hedges and ditches. Crop sprayers were still relatively simple in 1970, but most manufacturers, including Dorman of Ely and Ransoms of Ipswich, were both making sprayers with plastic tanks. In common with other machines, sprayers had increased in size by 1980. This trailed crop sprayer is typical of the period. Much improved design meant that sprayers were no longer little more than a tank pump and bouncing spray bar. When Vicon entered the sprayer market in the mid-80s, concern for the environment resulted in lower application rates and reduced drift, made possible by CDA, or Controlled Droplet Application Spraying. Some Lely sprayers were supplied with hydrospin units for CDA spraying. The hydraulically driven rotary atomizers would apply as little as 10 gallons per acre. Reduced chemical application was also made possible with the Sleeve Boom Sprayer. Introduced in 1982, these sprayers have a powerful blower which inflates the sleeve and the air blast forces chemical from the nozzles into the crop. Self-propelled sprayers, used mainly by contractors, also appeared at this time. With wide booms, high-capacity tanks and wide tyres, 
These machines cover many acres in a day. This SAM sprayer has a 24 meter boom and a 3,600 liter tank. Most companies who made sprayers 40 years ago are no longer in business, but Almonds are an exception. Their early 1990s range included this mounted model and a trailed sprayer with hydraulic folding booms. This mounted sprayer has the AirTech system with twin fluid nozzles. The chemical from the nozzle is further atomized and carried by compressed air into the crop. Some farmers still used a knife mower in the 1970s, but many had changed to a disc mower. Knife sharpening was no longer a chore, there were fewer blockages. Others preferred a drum mower. And some used a mower conditioner to cut the hay. A later model of Zetor drum mower folded for transport. Class were also making drum mowers and mower conditioners in the 1980s. Some were rear mounted, others were front mounted. And in Germany, farmers often collect grass to feed their cattle with a mower or forage harvester and a self unloading forage wagon. The Vicon Swather cut the crop with disc mower, conditioned it to hasten drying and left it in a high swath. The drawbar design allowed cutting to continue while turning a corner. Originally designed by Lely, the Vicon Acrobat was simple, cheap, easy to use and thousands were made during a 30-year production run. Power-driven machines had virtually replaced the Acrobat and other ground-drive machines by the mid-1980s. The class rotary tedder, the rotary rake used to row up the crop for the baler helped to speed up haymaking. Modern high-speed haymaking relies on power-driven swallow treatment machinery. The grass may be cut at high speed with a disc mower much higher outputs are achieved with front and rear mounted mower conditioners. And the Lely Lotus makes equally rapid progress when tedding or swath turning. Some farmers direct harvested grass for silage in the 1970s. Others used a mower, then collected the wilted swath with a forage harvester. The Class Jaguar was another example of the trailed precision chop forage harvesters used at the time. By 1980, Class were making a wider range of forage harvesters. This 40 inch cut model was direct coupled to a trailer. The cutting cylinder is the heart of all precision chop forage harvesters and needs sharpening at least twice a day.
less powerful tractors could be used with this engine driven Jaguar. But by the mid 1980s, many farmers hired a contractor and a self propelled harvester for silage making. When full, the trailer was hauled to the clamp where the discharge load was levelled and consolidated. The 300 horsepower Jaguar 690 was added to the class range in 1987. This one is making short work of harvesting grass at rates of up to 60 tonnes an hour on the Dutch polders. After a load is tipped at the clamp, the loader makes equally quick work of spreading and consolidating the grass. Bailing grass for silage has been practiced for many years, but less handling was involved with big bales. They were carried to the farmyard and sealed in a plastic bag.